just wait for a few people to join us today, but welcome. We look forward to getting going shortly. We'll just wait a few more minutes while people come in. So it's my pleasure today to welcome you to this LaunchVic webinar. We're delighted to be joined by two of our favorite people, Rachel Newman and Pedrin Mokram, who I'll introduce in a moment. Before I get going, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we are meeting and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. For me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, but I know there are people, including Rachel, who are joining from other lands. We very much look forward to today's discussion, which will be an exciting uh, panel, I have no doubt, with two of the uh, people I admire most and strongest thought leaders on a very important topic to us, and that is venture capital. Two years ago, we did some research at LaunchVic around the venture capital industry. Um, There's some real challenges in Australia. We don't have a very strong VC industry and we are underperforming. In fact, in 2018, we uncovered quite a significant shortfall of close to $100 million in seed and series A capital each year. That meant that we have to do something to fix this. And one of the things that we did was work with the Wade Institute and a big shout out to Georgia McDonald, Colin McLeod and the rest of the team at the Wade Institute, um, as well as Rachel Newman to pull together a course to help people upskill themselves in um, understanding the venture capital landscape. That course has run twice now. In fact, one course is underway right now, and I believe we've got a number of the cohort joining us today. Um, since that first cohort set off, um, the first alumni have already invested over $4 million into Victorian startups. A great start in helping improve our investor landscape, and we know they're gonna have much bigger impact in years to come. So what we're hoping today is to inspire you. If you're thinking about getting involved in the venture capital industry, want to understand more, you could not be in better hands with Rachel and Pedram. Um, they are responsible for bringing this exemplary program together and we know that you will enjoy the session today. Um, and I certainly encourage you to look into VCC if you're interested in finding out more. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rachel and Pedram. Um, Rachel is uh, known to many of us here um, she was once a LaunchVic board member. She's gone on to do amazing things in the sector, um, including working at Amazon Web Services, as well as working um, at Working Theory Angels, one of the angel groups we have recently announced. Um, I'd also like to welcome Pedram Mokram, um, lead instructor at VC Catalyst, um, practicing venture capital with um, deep experience and also adjunct professor at Stanford University, where he teaches and advises entrepreneurs and global companies about entrepreneurship. So Rachel and Pedram, it's my great pleasure to welcome you today and over to you. Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, and as you mentioned, I am on uh, the land of the Iroquois people of Bunjalung Nation, um, although my uh, heart and thoughts are with all of my fellow Melburnians uh, and folks in Victoria. Um, hopefully uh, things are going to start looking up. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be here today to have a fireside chat with my good friend Pedram. I'm going to let Pedram introduce himself, but first I'll uh, introduce how we got to know each other. So a few years back, I attended a course uh, that is somewhat has inspired the VC Catalyst program that Kate mentioned uh, that is run at Stanford University and Pedram was one of the instructors there. Um, so obviously uh, impressed by his, his prowess and incredible teaching, um, we both became uh, friends and I knew that when the program uh, was launched here in Melbourne that Pedram would be an integral part of that teaching staff. So it's been our absolute pleasure to have him involved now for the second course. Uh, Pedram, before we kick it off, and I have a bunch of topics I want to delve into with you, I would love for you to just introduce yourself. Kate gave you a great introduction, but you have a very interesting story. Um, so please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. And, and uh, um, first and foremost, I'm delighted to be here with all of you right now, um, speaking to you from Silicon Valley, um, where it's it's starting to become evening time and. Um, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that at some point we'll be able to reconnect again in person. Um, so I had such a delightful time in, in Melbourne last year when we actually did this program live. Um, so my background is um, I was actually born in Iran. I was uh, uh, lived there for, for the first few years of my life, um, moved to England with my parents, and then we finally settled in Canada, um, where we grew up in another country that has the queen on its currency. Um, so we have that in common, certainly. 
And um, we, um, uh, my, my parents and I uh, lived in a, a small town uh, in Southern Ontario, sort of in the, in the middle of, of uh, uh, the land of the automotive industry in Canada. Um, I, so as a result of that, I kind of grew up as an engineer, um, you know, various, you know, functions initially, you know, post-graduation, um, really just in the deep technology space. And, um, and I really want to kind of learn more and just to get a bigger sense of what was going on. And so that basically brought me out to grad school in California, um, uh, where I, I had my, uh, my PhD at, at Stanford focused on looking at markets and how markets evolve and how do you actually think about using quantitative models that we had in engineering and, uh, and, and apply that to the world of finance. Um, and then sort of luck serendipity, um, you know, what have you, happenstance, I ended up connecting with a few folks um, in the venture capital ecosystem and ended up actually joining a fund called Mayfield um, after graduation. Mayfield is, uh, is one of the oldest VC firms um, on the planet, let alone Silicon Valley. Um, they just celebrated their 50th anniversary last year. Um, I joined in fund 10 and I left uh, during fund 14. So I was there sort of in, in, the, in an interesting period of time and got to see a lot of people and uh, experienced a lot of things on the entrepreneurship side of things. Um, post that experience, I went back to Stanford as an adjunct professor um, and sort of an advisor to both funds, companies, corporations, startups um, alike. And as Rachel was, was mentioning, uh, one of the, the programs that we actually do at Stanford is, is, called, um, is a similar program to VCC, which is about sort of inspiring and, and helping um, bring to light some of the elements of um, early stage investing in, in startups and innovation opportunities. And the, and the reason that Rachel and I became friends is because she was the one person in the cohort in that session that we had that I was just terrified of, right? Because she, she was the, the one person that, that definitely knew more than me speaking in each of these sessions. And so I'd always have sort of one eye on her to make sure she wasn't frowning as I was saying things in my sessions. So um, so, so we, we've had, um, at, at the very least, mutual admiration. If, if nothing, it's been one-sided on my part, admiring what she's been doing and, and sort of very impressed with, with what she's uh, accomplished, not only um, uh, with, the, with the global VC community, but also at, at Amazon. So and we you can talk about other things I've been looking at over time too. You can't embarrass me. I get very red on camera and this is being recorded. So you know, keep, keep your uh, comments to yourself, Bedroom. But uh, I am happy to know that we are both uh, the presidents of each other's fan club. That's great. Yes. Um, Pedram, I want to kind of kick off um, with a little bit of a general question. But you have, um, for anyone who's taken the VC Catalyst program, you have a couple frameworks that everyone just loves because it takes these like fairly complex world models and it just makes it very clear and um, we understand how it works. And the one I want you to talk about is how VC capital is an important driver of innovation. A lot of people know, you know, VC capital is money and you throw it at startups um, and kind of like the money comes in and hopefully some out outcomes come out of it. But really what is the function of VC capital and how should we think about it as a key driver to innovation in an ecosystem? Yeah, totally. So um, one, one thing I realized was uh, very early on, I was always a graphic person. I, I, I don't understand things unless I can sort of put them into a box or draw a circle around them or have the circles, you know, interact with each other somehow. And, uh, and as I was trying to always figure out what is the role of VC, so if, if you're in the profession and you say, you know, you wake up every day and you're doing the, the, the job of, of being a venture capitalist, you, you, you kind of want to be able to explain what your role is in the world. And, and it took me several years before I started to actually come up with a, with a bit of a framework, which I call effectively the bow tie model. And, and the bow tie is, is kind of looking at what is the pool of capital on the, on the one hand, sort of imagine sort of the, the left side of the tie being this giant spectrum of money that's, that's devoted to research and development, um, which is government funding, which is corporate innovation funding and corporate R&D. Um, all the things that happen around universities, foundation money, you know, grant money, all kinds of things that are really focused on frontier technologies. And then everybody's sort of familiar with what, what goes on in global capital markets and what happens on the balance sheets of, of big corporations and sort of big, big business. And you can think about that as being the right-hand side of the, of the bow tie. There's a tiny bit of money in the grand scheme of things which connects these two ecosystems together. That's fundamentally what venture capital does. And so... 
I, I, I often sort of joke with, with my uh, more technically oriented VC friends that, that they're nerd whisperers, where, where they understand the language of technology. They understand the language of um, speaking with people that are on the frontiers of where the future can be and where the future can go from just a business model perspective, from a technology perspective, from a thought process perspective. And they can help shepherd those ideas through a development cycle and through maturity such that the folks that are financially oriented, that are, that are business and operations oriented, can actually take advantage of these. And that not in the middle of this bow tie is effectively what venture capital does, is it, is it basically connects the world of ideas that are too immature to be effectively thought of as being products or, or things that provide utility to the world that is too busy doing its, its thing um, and it can't really take its eye off of the operational efficiencies of, of running a corporation or um, you know, just big capital markets to start worrying about ideas on PowerPoint presentations. And this is fundamentally the piece of it that I think a lot of ecosystems suffer from because they, they think that it's all about putting money core into R&D, which is brilliant, but a lot of times it's not R&D, it's really just R. The D involves your understanding of markets and involves your understanding of productization and teams and incentives and everything else. And that D is really where venture capital um, is, is, is really ideally structured. We're, we're going to come back to this because I think um, there is discussion to be had around where players that are possibly at the ends of the bow tie start coming to the knot and we can talk about where that's working or not working. Um, but I want to pause for a moment and just take a little history lesson. Um, we often look to Silicon Valley as being the epicenter of um, both venture capital as well as kind of the last few, uh, you know, golden eras of, of technology companies. What is, from, a, from whatever we can learn from history, what happened in Silicon Valley? What were those key ingredients that came together that elevated it to the status that is enviable from ecosystems around the world? So sunshine and good soil. <laughs> I wish it was that simple. Um, which, which was actually is funny because Silicon Valley was actually a bunch of orchards at the time um, when it was first starting off, right? Um, the reality is, and I think a lot of people um, sometimes don't appreciate it. They, they think about Silicon Valley and they immediately just kind of say, okay, you know, that's like from when Google went public until now, right? And the reality is that Silicon Valley has taken almost 80 years, right, to, to get to where it is right now. Um, dating from really core technologies that were spun out of Stanford uh, and, and created HP as effectively the first, uh, Hewlett Packard was effectively the first, you know, quote unquote startup. Um, and then between that startup and the next one was almost like two decades, if you actually think about like the big successful ones. And then this cycle started to shrink. So, so your question is a, is a really powerful one, which is basically thinking about, well, if we were to rewind the clock and, and, and look at that history, what happened? And there's actually a couple of really great documentaries on this, and I encourage folks to look those up. Um, one of those is actually uh, produced by a, a good friend of mine uh, called Something Ventured, uh, which goes into the history of the Valley and, and really just the, the golden age of semiconductors, if you will, which is why the whole Silicon Valley ecosystem was called Silicon Valley. But if we actually are, were to unpack this and again, apply another one of my sort of circles or frameworks around this thing, the, the core of this, and the reason why Silicon Valley is centered around Stanford was that the core of this was actually around government funding that went into Stanford um, in order to promote more practical research um, in and around things around communications and systems and electronics. Um, part of that had to do with defense, but part of that had to do with sort of competitiveness of, of the US ecosystem in general. And, and some of the, that, that grant money um, that was funneling into Stanford actually helped to support a lot of the, the graduate students in the field. And then another thing that happened was then, then um, Stanford, because of this sort of bubble of innovation that it was starting to create from an academic perspective, also managed to um, pull in some of the, the early pioneers in the world of semiconductors as well, um, Bill Shockley uh, being one of the people there. But if you just think about that, the academic environment is, is not enough, right? So you say, fine, you know, some, some, some government support, some, some grant money that, that fuels the underpinning knowledge base of the graduate students that can actually go and do things um, and, and, and start things up. That's one element of it. 
Another element of it, which you, we can say was kind of lucky, or maybe it was because of the fact that it's kind of, you start, solved the chicken and egg problem, was the fact that there's some early investors that were really looking for different forms of, of assets to invest in. And, and so it wasn't just about the technologies and the entrepreneurs. It actually had to do with a broader ecosystem that was starting to say, well, you know, maybe there's something there and starting to realize that they can actually put some money behind these technologies with the assumption that these technologies were actually going to be huge in the long run. Right. And, and a few of them absolutely were like the semiconductor companies that, that we mentioned. But then if you think about some of the ones that are still standing today, like Intel and AMD came out of that, um, you know, ecosystem in the, in the late sixties, early seventies. And so the reality is that you've got to have the entrepreneurs, you've got to have the knowledge base that's, that's gotten them to give them a sort of a competitive edge in the first place but you then also need to have the investors that are willing to take on the risk. And if you think about something like a semiconductor company, a semiconductor company requires a huge amount of capital upfront before it can become, you know, get into revenues. And this was a complete novelty, right? This is, this is something that a, that a bank can't just, you know, write a debt um, check behind. And, and that was sort of the pioneering VCs um, that, that really was, were around supporting some of these companies that started to create that ecosystem. And then you had the entrepreneurs inside those companies, not only being technically savvy, but now also understanding how to run a startup and how to run a company that then spawned off and, and created their own. And this is effectively how this thing ended up, you know, taking on a life of its own. And this is where we got today now, right? That cycle has repeated itself almost like a biological organism so many times that has now permeated the DNA of the entire ecosystem here. I want to come back to this, this flywheel because you know, there's some conversation here in Australia or in Victoria specifically where we're like not quite at the point where the flywheel is spinning and we're getting that um, kind of nonlinear mul multiplicative, mul multiple, multiplying uh, effects. But you started to talk about some of the components of a healthy ecosystem. And I yeah. want you to touch upon them. So you talked about investors, you talked about some founders, um, you know, you mentioned some government funding, but, you know, there are other players there are the corporates, universities, as you mentioned, Stanford, there are accelerators. How do you see um, the key players and what are some of the um, important things that these key players need to either remember or do well, or how do they need to behave to really yeah. make this ecosystem hum? And maybe talk about where do you see that, you know, they tend to break down. And so like, where should we put some effort in? Especially totally. if you've got a young so, ecosystem like ours. Totally, so, so I, I kind of, um, I, I, so I, your ecosystem is, is fabulous, right? I've, I've had conversations with folks in ecosystems where, where it's just an aspiration and a hope and there's really no underpinning. So you're light years above and beyond anything else, right? There are very few ecosystems like Silicon Valley, but again, there's very few ecosystems that have had 80 years of, of time to mature to where they've gotten. I think there's effectively five pillars, right? That, that you need to have a functioning innovation ecosystem. Obviously you need the education piece of that, right? So whether it's STEM or, or an extension of STEM and thinking about sort of, you know, teaching entrepreneurship and the, and the business construct or, there's a whole variety of things we can talk about, but, but in a, it, the, the innovation education is one piece of that. A continuum of this is mentorship, right? Which is lifelong learning. So it's not just good enough to be able to teach people the raw physics of entrepreneurship, if there was such a thing. Once they graduate, they need to be in, inside of an ecosystem where, where there's some mentorship that's, that's you know, in support of that. Mentorship and innovation capital. I don't even want to call it venture capital, right? Let's just call it innovation capital because it is a spectrum, right? That little tiny knot that I mentioned in and of itself is a spectrum. So innovation capital goes hand in hand with mentorship because that's effectively what angel investors are, right? Angel investors are providing a check, but more importantly, they're providing this notion of smart money, right? And that's, there's a lot to be said there. And I'll come back to that particular point. We'll Following come back there. policy. Yeah, smart money is, we can, we can talk about smart money for like three hours. What, you know, what's dumb money and what's smart money? But so, so we'll, we'll at least talk about it for a couple of minutes. So we've got the education system, right? We've got the mentorship ecosystem. We've got the, the innovation capital. All of that has to have the right policy support. Like for example, the ability to have um, the right level of taxation, the ability to have the right level of um, 
corporate structures and, 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 and corporate governance, right? That, that, that allows you to be able to, to thrive and, and to be able to have solid grounds as an entrepreneur where, where you're not feeling like things are squishy or moving on you. And then all that is great, but then you also need to have this infrastructure. And this infrastructure is really interesting because this infrastructure is really the, the base around which you've got the, the existing corporations and the existing technologies providing the mechanisms and, and basically the, 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 the platform on top of which entrepreneurs can actually survive and thrive and, and take advantage of all the legacies. So these five things I think are the, are the core centerpieces. If you actually then, then step back and say, well, who, who participates in each of these? Clearly you've got the education system, right? And, and I'll, I'll put the universities at that, at that edge of where are the boundaries. You have the, the investor ecosystem and ideally they're playing well together. Um, you've got the, the government ecosystem that is listening to this entire ecosystem and making sure that the policies and everything it's doing is providing the catalyst for things to happen and not overdoing it. Because there's, there's an issue when, when the government starts to play the role and over, overreach itself in terms of what it's trying to do. And then last and certainly not least, if you don't have the corporates involved, you really don't have a conversation to be had because Statistically speaking, about 90% of venture investments end up being part of an M&A. And so people think about, you know, these standalone companies that go public and everything else, and that's br brilliant and beautiful and lovely. But that in and of itself does not provide sufficient liquidity for this ecosystem to exist. It's, it's really all those acquisitions. And so part of the acquisitions fuels this ecosystem, but also the corporations need to be involved in, in terms of being customers and being channel partners and allies to this. And this is what I mean by this broader definition of infrastructure, right? It's this community and this ability to be able to reach into the incumbents um, and actually be able to take part of what they're doing and, and not feel like they're, they're constantly at war with them or, or, or feel like every time they have a conversation, somebody's gonna steal their IP. And so this is really what it starts to take where things start to thrive is this notion of when I said smart money is when everybody is in alignment, right? The beauty of this innovation ecosystem that we're talking about is that it's not a zero sum game. So I don't need to steal from you in order for me to have, you know, this is not like a wall street thing where somebody loses because I made money. This is all about creation. And so long as everybody's aligned with that and, and you start to think about the creation of that alignment between these different pieces of the ecosystem, that's really where the, com the conversation takes on a magical shape. I'm in Byron Bay right now, so I'm all about alignment. Uh, I want to touch on the point that you made about corporates. Um, and I know you and I have had many a late night and a beer talking about uh, corporate participation in this ecosystem, both the importance of and some of the challenges. When we talk about that flywheel, um, and we touched upon it in the earlier conversation, um, one of the things that we need to have is that liquidity, right? We need uh, startups to exit that returns capital to investors. So not just proves out the asset class, but will attract more investors to that space. And we know that in Australia, we desperately need more private capital coming in. Uh, it turns founders into second time founders and hopefully, you know, she or he have learned many lessons and they'll be more successful. Um, it turns them into mentors, possibly into investors uh, and it turns their teams into future founders as well. So there's something powerful that happens from these exits. We are not seeing the rate of exits in particular through M&A, so purchasing um, by corporates of startups as we are in the ecosystems that are thriving, whether that's Silicon Valley or London or Tel Aviv. What can we do um, to help get our corporate partners, our corporate friends to be more acquisitory uh, and to engage. And one of the things that we know to be true, which is a complicating factor, is that uh, our corporates are measured on a time scale that is much different than an average startup is. So you think about a startup becoming successful or having great ROI in the like six to 10 years, uh, and then you look at the average corporate CEO and she or he is being assessed on a quarterly basis um, and paid an annual bonus. So there's some incompatibilities. How do we get over some of these hurdles to get corporates in the game, really playing well, and quite frankly, buying up startups? So I think uh, it's, it's, it's the billion dollar question, right? Um, 
maybe the trillion dollar question, in fact, uh, and, and, and I know this is one of the reasons why you and I love talking about this is because there, there's multiple reasons why a corporation would want to get involved with a, with a startup. Um, one is, is obviously as a, as a consumer of its products and services, but, but the next is sort of thinking about them as, as, as an acquirer. And many acquisitions happen for, for a lot of different reasons. And I think the, the rationale behind these acquisitions need, needs to start to expand. So, so historically speaking, right, if you think about an acquisition, uh, you may consider something as, as, as being just a, a business transaction, right? Where you say, okay, I'm acquiring this because this, this asset provides me access to this market, right? Or I'm acquiring this because I've got three quarters of, of my widget built and this thing basically, you know, completes that. A lot of times where you start to think about some of these new modern technology companies and how they're thinking about acquisitions, one of the first things that, that they'll think about is talent, right? And an acquisition is just a wonderful way of infusing different types of thinking and different types of talent inside of your corporation. But it's also a wonderful way of snuffing that innovation and, and, that, and that thought process out. Because if you're not at all structured around the thinking around what you want to do with these acquisitions from a talent perspective, a lot of times it goes wrong. So, so expanding the frame around which you want to consider why something is strategic to you should be redefined. Um, I'll never sort of forget, like looking back 10 years ago, and you look at a big conglomerate and, and, and you can pick your favorite one. It doesn't really matter what you, whether they're European or American, Asian, right? Australian, the, the longstanding companies, they would spend billions of dollars of their, of their balance sheet effectively buying companies that were very similar to themselves. And if the world is getting disrupted, the last thing that you want to do is become a fatter version of yourself. Right? So it, it sort of, begs the question, okay, well, if we were looking to spend, you know, a, a huge sum of our balance sheet on, on, on acquisitions of things that were super close to home, but just gave a scale, do we need to question that? And do we need to think differently? Do we need to think about new value propositions and new ways of accessing markets that we haven't thought of? Expansions and extensions of our product line that we haven't considered yet. New modes of thinking and new methodologies of, of approaching technology that the, the startup that we acquired, we may never use their product, but those 35 people that we're bringing on board is a representative of talent that we would have never been able to recruit in the first place. Once you start to put these different modes of thinking around the acquisition model, you start to then think about the acquisitions and the engagements with startup in a fundamentally different light. And it takes courage to do that, right? Because it doesn't take a lot of courage to, to look for the thing that's just like you, that's just slightly undervalued and you're basically paying the market arbitrage. It takes courage to say, yeah, you know what, we're really good at that thing. But if in 10 years time, the market doesn't want that thing from us, we need to start positioning ourselves in advance of that. And I'm telling you, it's 10 times harder to do it organically inside of a company than to just kickstart it with an acquisition, small or large, to kind of get you on that way there. I think it's such a good point that just the, if the value definition expands, then time to value also changes. And it's not uh, something that will be deferred for many, many years. There is immediate value that's, uh, that benefits come in, whether that's talent, et cetera. So I think that's, a, that's just a great point. People need to think more broadly. Um, and I often say um, corporates also need to be okay with the first couple acquisitions failing. Uh, because of what it will do is it'll teach them how to acquire better, how to integrate better, and um, hopefully uh, they'll get that uplift kind of 10 times over from the next one. I want to, um, you were talking about in Silicon Valley, there was, you know, HP, and then like the next big one came, you know, two decades later, and then all of a sudden it just kind of took off. And we have a similar story here in Australia. So there is um, a logo chart that actually Airtree, one of the venture funds, had put out here uh, with not, non exhaustive data, but it was illustrative in that you had 2000 and, um, you know, say 2000, you have a couple of logos, they were charting companies that are worth over 100 million. And there are a few logos, and then all of a sudden, you get to 2010, and all of a sudden to 2020, and you get, you know, four or five logos a year, and then boom, something is something critically changed. And it was off to the races. And uh, 
I would like to believe that, you know, in 50 years, when my kids are looking at that graph and they zoom out, that was just the first step uh, it, and it becomes almost uh, imperceivable on, on the grand scheme of things. But what do you think are some of those things that create these inflection points for nonlinear yeah. growth? And so if you had a magic wand and could wave it over Australia or over Victoria, what would you wish for to try and get that inflection point for us? I think if you, if you view an ecosystem as being a biological eco, ecosystem, right? We're, we're, we're in some cases it kind of is because because they're driven by people, right? And, and we're just these crazy, abnormal little, you know, biological beings, right? But, but if you th sort of view that as being almost like a, like a mimic of a biological ecosystem, the way that you can start to think about that is it's the same thing as, as thinking about cells dividing, right? Where you got a couple of cells and then and it's in how you end up with this exponential. It's more and more people get exposed to that frame of mind. Where, whereas, let's say two decades ago, you had a, a few people that were the true pioneers that either because of just sheer DNA strength or something that they've been exposed to, they, they were capable of, of, of sort of defying gravity and creating those outcomes. The people associated with them, either directly or, or sort of, you know, one step removed and just kind of observing what they're doing, end up with sort of not only the knowledge of how to do that, right? Like, what does it mean to sell if you're a startup? Think about that, right? Like if you've never seen a startup before, right? And then you say, hey, we've got this brilliant idea. Rachel and I are gonna have our own startup and then we're gonna to try to sell something into a bank. If you've never seen a startup sell a product or a vision into something as audacious as like selling into a corporate structure as like a bank, you would never do that, right? You'd just be like, that's stupid. But once you see somebody else do that, however successful they are or not, you're like, oh, I can do that, right? And, and, and you start to kind of figure out, well, what did that person do right? What did that person do wrong? And good Lord, like we had no idea that you could actually sell a PowerPoint presentation to a bank and make money off of it and then build your product. Like that actually works. It's, it's and, the four minute mile, right? No one was able to do the four minute mile until someone did. And then totally. hundreds of people. Exactly. That's, that, that's exactly it, right? It's, it's this notion that, oh, oh, oh that's, that's not that far out of the norm of reality. I can do that. And then so this is, this is what I mean by this biological observational sort of you know, dividing of the cells is, is, it, is it you're effectively observing something and you're like, well, I, I can do that, right? And, uh, and, and as soon as you start to get into that exposure where now that becomes almost the norm, this is where you start to actually see lots and lots of innovation. And in fact, you end up with having more of that innovative talent outside the corporations than inside because it's equally likely. The other thing that I think is very important to, th to think about is, is the societal norm of entrepreneurship. And, and there's always a bit of that. So, so when, when we talk about even the US market, the US is not uniform, right? When we think about entrepreneurship, right, there's pockets of that, but, but even in, in broad swaths of the United States even, right, or Canada, the notion of you starting a startup is it's still viewed as being risky, right? Or you're wasting your life or, or you should be a, you know, a surgeon or something else, right? Like you should be going, you're, you're so smart. You should be a, a lawyer. You should, you shouldn't be wasting your time doing this risky thing. And so I, I do think that there's a societal norm that, that follows suit with that to say, well, look, you know what? Maybe it isn't that sexy. Maybe it isn't that, that crazy. Maybe it isn't that off the charts for somebody to actually aspire to be an entrepreneur or to work for an entrepreneur because now it's not nearly as crazy as, as somebody saying, well, you know, I'm super smart and talented and I chose not to be a, a solicitor. Right. Um, so that's, that's the other thing that happens. So if I had my magic wand, I, I basically say you guys are, are, are in a perfect spot already. I, I wouldn't really try to do too many things. I think you're doing all the right things. You do need a little bit of patience. But if there was anything that I could say would accelerate it even further, it would be the incorporations of the corporate ecosystem, of the natural resource ecosystem, of the healthcare ecosystem that you guys have um, really a lot of thought leadership on and a lot of you know, uh, great structure already in place for them to be supportive of some of these crazy entrepreneurs. The capital will follow, yeah. right? The education system follows. I want to just ask a little bit about uh, whether it's education or the future of work. I know this is something that also you think about quite a bit, Pedram. Um, 
you know, we often talk about founders, but we know one in a million will actually be a founder. But for every founder, we need tens and then hundreds of people to work with them and help to build out these startups that will compete on the global on the global stage. When we think about educating these folks, it, we run into some challenges because the jobs of the future, these companies that are going to be really difference making, we don't know what those are yet. So how do we think about um, skilling ourselves or our children uh, to be part of this workforce of the future when so much of it is yet to be created? It's to, to, to your point in terms of me thinking about a lot, it's, it's literally like what I think about 24 hours a day. It's, it's what I sleep, you know, um, and, I, and I dream about. Um, I think it's probably one of the most profound opportunities right now um, that, that, that's, that's sort of facing us. I don't consider it a challenge. I truly consider it to be an opportunity. And the, the reason for that is because if you actually rewind and you think about sort of the education ecosystem, the, ed the educational ecosystem that we know today has not been around for that long, right? It's, it's, you know, structurally speaking, yes, universities have been around for a long time, right? But, but structurally speaking, the system is, is only about 150 years old. And, and it was out of necessity that, that we had schools, right? We had structured education. And, and then we were divided up into grades. And then, and then you know, all these the standardized testing and, and all this other stuff has evolved over a very short span of time, much like, you know, arguably medicine has, right? So we've now gotten to the point where if you think about traditional education, you, you'd go through this cycle, right? Where you get educated, 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 and then you just be launched into the world and you are an accountant, right? Or you're a lawyer or you're, you know, whatever, pick your profession. And it was, you, you're getting trained for the first call it 25 years of your life to be able to be functional for the remaining 50, right? If you're, if you're lucky. The reality today is all these ecosystems and all these professions are actually starting to change. So what we started seeing over the past 10 to 15 years was more emphasis around these additional professional degrees, right? Going around and, and trying to actually upskill people. What I think is going to happen basically from 2020 going forward is that instead of the overarching view of, of education being effectively something that you do when, when you know, before you're 25 and then you stop educating yourself and you start working, effectively looking like a sine wave. And this sine wave is, is all about lifelong learning. And it's all about thinking about the fact that your skills are going to have to be resharpened and retuned every five years. And that mentality is what a lot of people have already been doing, right? If you actually start to think about some of the the more you know entrepreneurial types of people that you have in you know in your network, you, you can kind of see that they've basically redefined and re-envisioned themselves every sort of five to seven years to date. And I think you're going to start to see a lot more of that happening, especially as you start to see some of these jobs. Even even you know when we say like an accountant, an accountant's job is going to be fundamentally different ten years from now, right? My my absolute favorite example of this was uh, was a company that that pitched me. Um, when I was at Mayfield almost, I want to say eight years ago, it was brilliant. It was all about um, this amazing world-class photographer who had started a company to teach other photographers how to do photography in the new digital age. And, and he told me something that was extremely obvious, but I never really thought about it. He said, look, if, if you're a photographer from like, call it 1950s or even before that through to the year 2000, even 2005, maybe even up to 2010, your, your skill set was about, you know, framing, but then understanding sort of the chemistry of film. And that's wonderful. But if you don't understand how to do the digital portion of that, there's sort of like that additional 10% of skill sets that you need that basically makes you useless. Right. Like you won't go get a wedding photographer who doesn't know how to do Photoshop anymore. Right. Like just because they frame something doesn't necessarily mean that they can actually build a book of business. That's that's not niche anymore. You and I don't need Photoshop, Pedro. But uh, well, yes, but well, you, yes, no, there's actually a, a giant filter over my screen here. <laughs> it's an avatar of myself. Yeah. That's, but yeah, um, it's, it's this notion of lifelong learning that I think has to be embedded into our thinking 
societally and also within corporations where skills are evolving so quickly. I want to ask one final question and then I'm going to open up to there's some Q&A that's come through and I'll, um, I'll pose some of those to you. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit. E Silicon Valley has been building over the last 80 years. We all look to it as, you know, on the top of the mount. Um, and yet, you know, we have people like Peter Thiel saying the next great deal. There's no way in hell that's going to come from Silicon Valley anymore. We know that in 2020, uh, literally droves of people have left the city um, to seek out places with cheaper cost of living and clean air. Um, is Silicon Valley dead? <laughs> Such a good question. Um, no, um, you know, I think, I think that's a, it's a simple response would be just to say no, right? But it, it, you know, I'd be hard pressed to be able to have the same sort of knee jerk, you know, reaction, you know, literally four weeks ago when the sky was orange right, for like an entire week, and we couldn't see out in our backyard. Um, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of change that's happened around sort of the, the broader environmental change, right, Be, being obviously COVID has, has been a massive, massive um, shift in terms of how people are living and working, but then you end up with, with all the air quality issues around all the fires, right, the four million acres of land that's basically just gone up in smoke, and, and, and you're starting to realize that the notion of of placement and proximity is, is not what it used to be. Now that said, um, I don't think the world has quite figured out how to do digital innovation, right? Uh, and, and we can literally spend an hour talking about that, right? But, but if you just think about the whole notion of like the water cooler conversation or, or that serendipitous interaction with somebody that you meet at a conference that says something that sparks a, you know, a creative thought, I don't think we figured out how to bottle that serendipity right into a digital zoom meeting yet and as a result of that i think once once things unthaw we go back to a little bit more normalcy right that power of human interaction in and around innovation is still going to be very very important and interesting that said the fragility if that's even a word of that construct right that everything has to be concentrated within a 25 kilometer radius it has been fundamentally questioned, right? And then the world is starting to really come to terms with the fact that yes, it is about talent and that talent can now live anywhere. What I'm hoping is that that basically evangelizes other ecosystems and empowers a lot more entrepreneurs to realize that they have access to talent now and that talent is everywhere. And I do think that there is a bit of a catalyst with a simultaneous one-two punch that we've had in the past six months here in, in Silicon Valley, one biological and then one sort of physical with the fires that's starting to shine a light on that, right? So I don't think it's dead. I just think that people are starting to realize that it can be replicated and some of that, um, some of the, some of that charm, I think, is polished off of it a little bit. I think that uh, it is very interesting. It will be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, you know, as you said, with people distributing, um, we'll see if, you know, the pendulum is swinging in one direction and we'll see if it swings back or if it finds a new, new equilibrium. Uh, interesting times ahead. I'm gonna um, call out some of the questions that have come through the Q and A. So if you have a question, please go ahead and post it. I'm gonna combine two. So two questions are kind of double clicking on our conversation around corporates and their role. Um, one was asking, why do you think big companies are frightened to engage with startups and what can we do to change their thinking? Uh, and the second one is actually tactically, uh, if a corporate doesn't find you, how would you approach them about a possible uh, working relationship or a transaction? The first one, I think, you, you know, I, I'm, I've been trying to understand that first one for about call it 10 years, right, in, in earnest. And, and I think it wasn't until I realized that, you know, and it, this may sound facetious, but it's true, right? A corporation is not a logo, right? A corporation is like a bunch of human beings that have their own incentive structures and incentive and motivations for, for being in that corporation in the first place, making a bunch of decisions. 
And so the reality is that a lot of times the, the incentives are misaligned um, with the people inside of the corporations. And so the, the, the corporations that I, that I kind of, you know, I, I roll my eyes and maybe shake my head and be like, wow, you know, you guys talk a lot of talk about innovation, but good Lord, your, your, your people are actually the, the, the first people that are gonna kill innovation in the first place. You can talk about it, you can, you can create marketing, you know, about it. You can do all kinds of things from a corporate perspective. But if you haven't created the right culture and the right incentive structures for your people to be able to engage at a day-to-day -day and transactional basis with that broader ecosystem, right, it's going to fail. Just, just, just quickly thinking about the person that's in Corp Dev that's about to acquire a company, right? They're sitting there thinking, is this going to get me promoted? Or what if I acquire that company, right? And I put my neck on the line and it becomes a failure because I acquired, you know, 30, you know, 20 year olds that are super smart in AI, but you know, we don't really know what to do with them. So it's going to, you know, impact my professional career inside of this company. So I think the, the, the reality is that we need to unlock some of that friction point down inside of the actual talent pool inside of the corporations before the corporations can actually start to work with, with startups. I don't, I don't know if I answered your second question or not. Uh, that's just how to, how to get on their radar. How to get on their radar is, is, is finding the right people. Right. And, and again, that was, that was sort of when I was saying that we haven't quite figured out how to do digital innovation. Um, it's really finding the right people that have that problem that you can solve if you're trying to sell into them. Because again, it's, it's not about the logo having the problem, right? It's about the individual who has the authority to make a purchase and being able to truly make them successful. Um, so, it really has to do with doing proper need finding. If you are a, uh, if you are trying to sell into the corporate space as a startup, if you've done that proper need finding, you'll know exactly the persona inside of these corporations that you should be selling to. Yeah, great point. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, a little hustle goes a long way uh, in this world. <laughs> Um, Pedro, someone asked, uh, you know, obviously we were talking about exits, we were talking about spinning the flywheel with exits, and the question is, why is everyone so obsessed with exits? Why can't we have bootstrap uh, startup as a growth model and representative success? Why is the success goalpost an acquisition? It's a, it's a fantastic question, and, and in fact, one of the reasons why um, I, I kind of view this with, with more of a macro lens is because um, I, I left the land of venture because I, I kind of saw the limitations in the venture capital model. And so I'm not basically saying that the only way to innovate is, is by having venture capitalists and then exits and a lot of people, you know, concentrating returns and all that stuff. That's not the point at all, right? The, the point is around supporting an innovation ecosystem, which may take on the model of having bootstrap companies, right? Companies that take different forms of capital, companies that take venture capital, right? companies that are born within other companies, right? So there's all kinds of different models. But there's one important thing just to kind of talk about here in, in the context of sort of the bootstrap business. Um, it's very important to understand that, that most really profoundly interesting technology companies, um, and, 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 and Atlassian, which is sort of a, a, a wonderful story from, you know, from, from Australia, was truly an anomaly in terms of being, being able to break in um, on a profitable basis. But a lot of companies can't. The reason for that is one, they, they, they need to spend a lot of money developing a product before they can start to sell it. Um, the technology just takes a lot of you know maturation cycles, right? If, if it's deep tech or if it has anything to do with really with hardware, sometimes the sales cycles are so long that, that you need to have all kinds of support and infrastructure before you actually get into revenues. And for all of these different reasons, you can start to view effectively this notion of a J curve that you need to go through before you can start to get into the revenues. And in many cases, you, you know, you, you have to be either incredibly savvy to navigate that J curve without having to raise money around it. But sometimes it's just prohibitive to be able to even think about how do you go from one point to the next without having that investment cycle. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge proponent of, of bootstrap companies. So long as the sales cycles and the product development cycle fits that model. And if it doesn't, you're going to spend three times as much time and effort with a third of the level of talent because you can't afford to pay them to try to get to the same outcome. Yep. 
I, I think that's um, such a good point and one that sometimes doesn't make it into these conversations around VC is that VC is not for everyone, is not for every company, but in the conversation of VC, an exit is important because it, it's, it's what creates the liquidity. It's what takes that money that's been uh, locked up and it frees it yeah. and releases it to be deployed again, um, ideally in a larger state from uh, which it went in. Um, we have another question that has come through around, um, let's see, which one? Oh, lots of uh, interesting stuff about corporates. We're gonna just move on. Uh, there's just a very tactical question that's come through. I thought uh, maybe you'd wanna weigh in on that, which is one of the hardest things for startup founders and investors is often agreeing on evaluation. What do you think about using a Berkus method versus another method versus just a pure negotiation? And I'm happy after you answer that to kind of talk about early stage maths and uh, that black art. It is a black art. Dark, um, dark art. Yeah. The, 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 the recent, uh, most recent uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, which was announced um, earlier this week, went to a Stanford professor on this, uh, on the topic of auction theory, right? Um, and fundamentally, early stage valuations should be viewed as being a tiny little auction, right? When there is one investor in town that's interested in putting, right? So just, just kind of abstract everything away and just kind of go down into like the basic model, right? There's only one investor in town and there's 35 entrepreneurs looking for that one investor's money, right? Who dictates the valuation? You can come up with as much crazy math as you possibly want. At the end of the day, it's that one investor that gets to dictate that, right? So, so it's, it's effectively a supply and demand question. And, and what we've seen right now over the past um, five years actually is, is this ballooning of valuations in terms of the, the startups because of the sheer amount of capital that's going into the venture ecosystem. It's driving the valuations up because of the supply and demand balance is actually starting to shift. Could you start to do really intense level of mathematics? It's all about alignment, right? So what's the business model for the fund to make it work, right? You say, okay, well, they need to have X percentage ownership, right? At this multiple valuation before they can start to actually return money, risk adjusted back into their fund. Great. That basically proves how much and how far up the valuation stream can go. And it basically then sets the upper limit of what the valuation is. The lower limit is basically saying, how much do I actually need to leave behind for the entrepreneur for them to remain motivated to go and, and continue to do this? And how many more options does this entrepreneur have vis-a-vis -vis the, the offer that I'm giving them? That basically sets the other limit. And then as soon as you get into an efficient cycle, you kind of realize that the market determines what the valuation is even in an illiquid market like early stage, you know, startups. You probably have a more elegant answer than that, so. No, I have a, a less elegant one, but you, you touched upon it. And that is the, especially with early stage companies when we don't have a lot of hard data or even revenue to pull a multiple off of, we say, how much money do you need to get to that kind of next uh, key milestone? Uh, we make that amount of money equal about 20% of the business and multiply it by five. And there you have your valuation. Um, and, you know, I'm involved in a deal right now where there is little revenue, but, you know, just very high conviction from all the investors in this founder, in this space, in this uh, solution that's being developed. Um, the valuation is eye wateringly high considering we don't have revenues yet because we've done that math. How much does she need? Therefore, how much do we dilute her? How much is this worth? And the way as an early stage investor, you stomach that number that is, seems like it's floating and not grounded in anything is that you have to have such high conviction that this is probably gonna be a binary company. It's either gonna have a terminal value of zero or a terminal value of six to $8 billion, in which case that early you know, six or nine mil val is going to be a rounding error. Um, and some companies, that's how it is. Like th there is no potential for a two X or a three X. This is either going to be a hundred X or a zero X. Totally. Um, and so we almost don't pay attention to that early number. You just put as much fuel on the fire as possible, uh, and off you go. So that's uh, a less eloquent and less, uh, scientific answer to it. Um, I want to just quickly check in. We have five minutes until we have to close. Obviously, Pedram and I are going to talk for the next three hours if you guys want to watch. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I want to quickly, Kate, 
uh, do we need to wrap up or do we have time for one more question? I think we have time for one more. All right. Uh, I'll finish the last question actually came into the chat, but I think it's an interesting one. And that's just about lifelong learning. So Pedro, you talked about that. Um, uh, this person shared some statistics that at PwC, less than 25% of their people are spending their $1,500 discretionary training budget. How do we have a mental shift, uh, especially for maybe some of us who are caught in the middle of, you know, micro-credentialing of the future and the four-year university of the past? How do we shift mentally, uh, individually, and from a corporate perspective, from a know-it-all to a learn-it-all? So... Um, it, wonderful question, and 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 I'm and I'm worried that we're going to consume more than the five minutes. So I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. I think one of the things, just from a corporate perspective, is is going forward. I think the 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 new workforce planning model is going to have to start to think about more skills based roles versus role based roles, right? And maybe like, well, how, what what does that actually mean? Well, if you think about sort of titles as basically saying, well, you know, we we have this title, and we need to fill somebody that has this title that is going to start to shift when that particular function starts to actually take on a different shape in and of itself. And so the definition of that function is going to be skills-based going forward. As soon as we start to have that skills-based mentality, right, then the reflection becomes on the employee to start to think about, great, what kind of skills do I need to get into those different types of functions versus basically just checking off a series of boxes to say, yeah, you know what, because I did this role, now I can go do that role. Now I can go do that role. My, my favorite example of that is actually in the field of thinking about something like even product management or product development, right? Being a, being a product manager in, in sort of an old school company is more of a, about project management and managing a lot of like bureaucracy and, and things like that. Being a true product manager in the context of a digital um, product is different. It takes different skill sets. It, it takes an understanding of statistics and A-B testing, right? It takes an understanding of the new frameworks and, and, and the new incentive structures to try to get your team to work, right? It's a shift of mentality of thinking about where is their IP versus the leverage of open source products and platforms, right? So it's a fundamentally different skill set of just thinking about the same notion of just thinking about a product manager, right? As soon as you introduce a new dimension of, well, now we need to be more digital, right? You can think about a bank even having that kind of role. So the more entre entrepreneurial the employees are thinking about what skills do I need to accumulate to get into the cool things that I want to start doing going forward and the more responsibility I'm going to take on, the more they're going to start to realize that that 1500 can actually go a long ways. And, and I think the, the problem is that we're, we're starting to really get into that inflection point of that different type of thinking, which makes it both scary and exciting, right? I think it's exciting from the ability to introduce new technologies and structures to kind of push people in that way of thinking. And it's a little bit scary for people that are just not really comfortable with that, you know, orientation. But I actually think that, you know, even employees are going to have to start to think a little bit more entrepreneurially as they want to sort of climb the corporate ladder versus, you know, in, in any profession versus, you know, what they may have had to do before. Uh, and we're starting to see that. It's really yeah. interesting. Absolutely. Well, Pedro, unfortunately, we are at time. It's been a pleasure, as always, to chat with you. And thank you, everyone, for participating and asking some great questions. Um, Kate, I will hand it over to you. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. And um, can I say how much I enjoyed this? Often I'm the one um, uh, doing the interviewing and it's really lovely to sit back and, and watch a, a conversation that was so free flowing and so insightful. And um, every time I talk to both of you, I learn things and um, bring a new frame of reference. And my goodness, what a great conversation to starting with deep insights into Silicon Valley and moving through into to corporates, which we know is a really big issue here, more broadly into the future of education and along the way, some real gold minds and, and tips on, um, on how to invest and, and things to look out for. So thank you so much, both of you for sharing your wisdom. We really, really appreciate it. And thank Thank you to everybody else. I know, uh, Pedro, you've got a few more fans on the uh, chat. There's a, a few people that are, are talking about uh, uh, they want to follow you. Rachel, we know you always gather fans wherever you go. So um, thank you again. And we look forward to seeing everyone soon. See you soon. Cheers. Thank you all. Bye.